Well, thank you, Rory, and um, thank you very much to, to everyone for, uh, for coming to today. It means um, a lot to me. So when I was started to put this talk together, of course, you ine inevitably start to think about, well, how did I get here? And I think it would be fair to say, uh, Mum, that we didn't think I'd be here uh, when I started school in 19... Blah. So how did I get here? And again, you, you know, you start to think about these things. And actually, I decided that these two photos probably sum up um, how I got here. So this, and it's really, it's thanks to parents and it's thanks to family. So this is sort of just before I started school, just after I finished university. And it is thanks to family and thanks to, to my mum and, and dad and my mum who's here today who grasped the concept of Athena Swan, I think, quite a bit before Oxford University, and the fact that education equals opportunity, um, and I really can thank you for that. Having said that, though, I didn't actually like school. I really didn't like school. I enjoyed it on the first day, and I came home for lunch, so, re so the story goes. I came home for lunch on the second day. I said, you know, I don't actually like it very much. I don't want to go back, um, and that carried on really throughout and I think that's maybe reflected in the fact that these were about the only two school photographs uh, we could find. I think I'm about seven there um, and about um, 14 there. Um, so as a slow starter but there's something to be said for that because actually one can only pleasantly surprise people and never disappoint if you, um, <laughs> if you start slowly. So I pleasantly surprised everybody and passed my A-levels and then I went on to do A-levels in chemistry, physics and maths. I didn't like chemistry and I quite liked physics and maths, so I didn't love them and I was quite good at them but I wasn't brilliant at them. So then, but I knew I wanted to go to university. My sister, my older sister Helen was at Exeter University and I'd been down to visit her and I had a great time. Uh, so I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to go because it looked really good fun. So what could I do with physics and maths? And for some reason, um, and it's great for a reason, I chose engineering because I thought that combined the physics and maths. But any of you who know me at all will realise that was never going to fly because I can barely wire a plug. So, so I, I did a year of engineering and I was lucky that I had a good tutor there who also recognised that maybe engineering wasn't the career for me, but I'd done okay in the maths and so he suggested I swap to um, pure maths um, and statistics. I'd never done statistics before and it was probably the first time um, in my um, educational career where I actually found something I did enjoy um, and that I really wanted to pursue. I also did subsidiaries in computer science and psychology which were fun and useful and you can decide for yourselves which was which was which. So I graduated in 1988 from, from Leicester University with a maths and stats degree and I still didn't really know um, what I wanted to do with myself and I got a job but quite serendipitously really I got a job uh, in the financial services industry as a graduate trainee but you might notice that's grayed out as well and that lasted even less time uh, <laughs> than engineering because it became rapidly clear that I didn't want to be an accountant or um, and I wasn't going to be an investment banker <coughs> and so I looked in the graduate vacancies and I saw a job for a medical statistician at Boehringer Ingelheim and I thought actually that's what I want to do I'd love the medical statistics module in my undergraduate degree um, and this had the added bonus that Boehring and Ingelheim are based in Bracknell, which was 20 minutes away from my new boyfriend, Simon Lewington. So, uh, so I took the job and I went to work at Boehring. Uh, and then, but after I'd been there a few years, it kind of became clear to me. I really enjoyed it, but um, I wanted a higher degree. I wanted to do um, a, degree, a master's in medical statistics. And I had a great boss there called Andy Lawton, who was very supportive. And he managed to persuade the medical director to give me a sabbatical to go to Southampton University to do a master's in medical statistics. And so I graduated from there in 1994. And my, um, this is really where Oxford begins to come in, because my thesis, my master's thesis was on meta-analysis. They had some data on um, respiratory trials that they needed a meta-analysis done for. So again, Andy said, well, why don't you do that for your dissertation? Because it sort of, you, we can pay you a bit to do it and you also get your thing. Uh, Richard, I don't know if you remember, but I rang you up one Friday afternoon because I was doing this meta-analysis and the, the point for the statistics was to compare the fixed and the random effects models. You can see where this is going, any of you who know Richard. <laughs> and the random effects model was 
even to me giving the wrong answer. And so I noticed that there was this Richard Pito seemed to be publishing quite a bit on meta-analysis. And Andy said to me, why don't you give him a ring? And it was a Friday afternoon and Richard, um, I was immediately put through to Richard and chatted to him for about half an hour where he told me exactly why the random effects model um, was going wrong. But I also realised that probably, Richard, you had a deadline <laughs> if you had half an hour to talk to a uh, medical statistics student. So I then realised when I was doing the medical statistics, actually, it wasn't trials I was interested in, it was epidemiology. And this was maybe the first time I'd really come across epidemiology, and I loved the epidemiology module in the medical statistics. And so when the, a job was advertised in Oxford, I applied for it, and that was for a two-year um, contract to work with Nawab Kizilbash on the prospective studies uh, collaboration. <coughs> So it came in 1995, and I also persuaded Richard and Noab to co-supervise me to do a defil. So these were in the days where you didn't have to apply, you just asked, and, uh, and, it, <laughs> and it happened. And so I registered um, for a defil in epidemiology, and um, the original project was meant to be lots of risk factors for stroke, but within a month of being here, um, discussions with Richard and with Noir, we changed it to blood pressure, cholesterol, and all causes of, of premature death. Um, and so I graduated in 1999. Rory was one of the examiners of that, Rory and Stephen McMahon. Now, I don't know if you remember Rory, but um, I think it was a Monday, and so you clearly read it, you and Stephen had clearly read it over the weekend. Stephen on the plane on the way over, because he came with this sort of scruffy, I don't know, it was even the nap, airplane napkin. <laughs> Rich, Rory walked in with my thesis with a yellow sticky on nearly every other <laughs> page. <laughs> so I felt like I got a thorough grilling um, from that. But that's really how, how I came to be here and how I came to be in the Richard Dole building and studying the causes of premature death. Death in old age is inevitable, but death before old age is not. And if we look at data from 2016, there were about 57 million deaths a year, of which 30 million we were before the age of 70, so premature according to the, the World Health Organization. Um, about 10 million of those before the age of 30, 6 million um, at young ages, and you know, tremendous success um, at, at younger ages. That's gone down from about one in four globally uh, children, babies dying before they were five in 1950 to less than 5% now. And that's work done and continue to be done by, um, in part by the perinatal epidemiology unit here. It's um, amazing work done there. But I focus my, my work on, on middle ages here. I'll define it as 30 to 69. So of those 30 million, 20 million uh, are in middle age, 18 million due to medical causes and 2 million to external to injuries and suicide etc. So of those 18 million, a third are due to cardiovascular diseases, a further million to diabetes, 5 million to cancer and 3 million to other medical. And again, really my focus has been on, on the cardiovascular disease and slightly on diabetes. So can we have premature mortality? Well, evidence from the UK suggests we can. So these are death rates uh, from 1950 to 2010 in the UK. So a 35-year-old in 1970, a 35-year-old male, about a quarter of them would be dead by the time they're 70. By 1980, that's um, about 20%. And by 2015, just 5% dead. So a massive decrease in vascular mortality in the UK over the last 40 um, or 50 years. And, and this is due to both treatment and prevention. So these deaths are pre clearly are um, preventable. And the major, we know from high income countries that the major modifiable causes of vascular mortality are blood pressure, blood lipids, adiposity and diabetes, and, and tobacco. But most of that evidence comes from studies in high income countries. So what do we know about these risk factors? Well, I say I came to Oxford in 1995, and this was the um, publication from the first cycle of the prospective studies collaboration, so it was tabular data. Um, 
I think it set me up really because I arrived in January 1995 and by December 1995 I, ha I had a Lancet um, publication. But this was cholesterol, diastolic blood pressure and stroke. This was just looking at stroke and so you see for diastolic blood pressure for 10 millimetres of mercury difference at least at younger ages there's about a twofold difference in risk for every 10 millimetres higher but it seems to be somewhat weaker um, at older ages. And this the story was more equivocal for cholesterol, where we see no association um, at older ages between total cholesterol and total stroke risk, but maybe some evidence of a positive association at younger ages. And it was really these findings that prompted us to focus on blood pressure and cholesterol for the second cycle of the Prospective Studies Collaboration. I should have said at the beginning, note the dates here. So 1999, I submitted my thesis on this. You'll note the dates of the articles. So when Rory said this is a long-term um, job, it really is a long-term job. But there's a reason for that, and I hope that will become clear. So 60 studies, 1 million adults, 90% of them were from Europe and the US. Uh, 60,000 vascular deaths in about 13 years of follow-up. So it's largely a study of what was happening in Europe and North America towards the end of the 20th century. But the big thing I think that made a difference for this collaboration and why these took so long but why ultimately they were so successful was because of the attention to the statistical detail. So what was it that was so special about this? We need to avoid chance findings. So much of the epidemiology in the 20th century was um, chance findings and um, confusion arising from conflicting uh, reports on even these major risk factors for disease. We need to avoid reverse causality, where the prior disease, people who have disease, it affects their risk factor rather than the other way around. So we exclude people who've already got disease, and we exclude the first few years of follow-up in case there are people with preclinical disease. We need to assess not just the current exposure but the long-term average or the so-called usual levels of the exposure and that we need to do the analyses by age at risk not um, by age at baseline as those previous analyses were. <coughs> Excuse me. And because of those attentions to statistical details. Ultimately, we didn't publish a lot. We weren't prolific in our publications, but what we did publish has been cited now more than 10,000 times, and I have no doubt it was because of the attention we paid to the statistical detail. So why does size matter? Well, here's um, data that uh, we, we did for Rory when he was setting up the UK Biobank, and this is CHD mortality versus systolic blood pressure in a random selection of 5,000, 50,000 and 500,000 participants from those a million in the prospective studies collaboration. So for those of you who are epidemiologists, a sort of Framingham size study, a British doctor size study, or a UK Biobank size study. And you see that with just 5,000 people, the data are all over the place, there's really no evidence of any association, it looks like it's incredibly strong for people if they're 60 to 69, maybe even inverse association, so higher blood pressure associated with lower risk um, at older people, and that maybe explains why there was so much confusion around in the 20th century about the real importance of uh, blood pressure, even blood pressure for cardiac mortality and particularly at older ages. If we go to 50,000 adults, then it's kind of beginning to come into focus and we're beginning to see these positive <coughs> associations at all ages. But there was a lot of concern that you could push blood pressure too low and there's this so-called J-shaped relationship where the risk begins to go up again if you go too low. And I'm sure you could convince yourself for people who are in their 40s that that, that could be a J-shaped relationship. And so it's only really when you get the really big numbers, the hundreds of thousands, not the, ten, not the thousands or the tens of thousands, but the hundreds of thousands, that this picture really comes into focus. And you see not only is there a positive association, but it seems to be throughout um, the range and pretty similar at all ages. So we've avoided chance findings and avoided reverse causality. What's, what, what about long-term average or usual levels of exposure? And this was really the focus, uh, the sort of theoretical focus of, of my DPhil was regression dilution bias. 
And this is the phenomenon whereby the purely random fluctuations in your exposure, so your blood pressure fluctuates daily over, um, over long, and over longer periods of time, same with cholesterol. And those random fluctuations in the risk factor, they don't lead to random fluctuations in the estimate of, your, of the association with risk, but they systematically make that association uh, too shallow. And yet, uh, due to work by Rory and Richard and Stephen McMahon in the 1990s, they showed <coughs> that really you can quite simply, with just a resurvey, with just one resurvey, you can make allowance for this uh, bias and show that the true relationship is really very much steeper. So I'll just illustrate that with the, the um, prospective studies collaboration. So again, CHD mortality versus now baseline systolic blood pressure. So the measured systolic blood pressure at the baseline visit, there were 34,000 deaths. So, so we've got the size here at ages uh, 40 to 89. And we divided people up into 10 groups according to their um, systolic blood pressure and then plotted risk on a doubling scale against the mean blood pressure in each of those 10 groups. And what you see is that at least up to about 180 millimetres of mercury, for every 20 millimetres of mercury, lower systolic blood pressure, about a quarter uh, lower risk. But it does look like the strength of that association, although it's still positive, it maybe attenuates um, as, you, as you get higher. Well, why is that? Well, it's because um, the people here, it not only contains people who have genuinely um, low blood pressure, but it will contain a disproportionate number of people who were just on a low day on that visit. And so if you remeasure the, the blood pressure of the group as a whole, then on average the blood pressure will be higher. And similarly at the top, not only does it contain people who have genuinely high blood pressure, but it will contain a disproportionate number of people who are at the sort of right-hand end of their distribution of blood pressures are on a, a random high just on the day that you measured them. And so when you remeasure those people, on average, the mean will come down. And so in, the, um, in this prospective studies collaboration, we had 300,000 people who were resurveyed. They were resurveyed between two and 15 years after the baseline visit, but on average, three years later. So here you have the 10 groups, uh, about 100 millimetres of mercury between the top and the bottom group, and that, if you remember, was associated with about a fourfold relative risk. But just three years later, the mean, the difference in the mean between these groups is no longer 100, but it's just 65 <coughs> millimetres of mercury. So in other words, that fourfold relative risk, it's not associated with a difference of 100 millimetres of mercury. It's actually only associated, or associated with just only 65 millimetres of mercury. So if we plot risk not against here, but against the, the means uh, resurvey, then you see that the relationship is very much steeper. It's now about 40% lower risk for every 20 millimetres of mercury, lower usual or long-term average blood pressure. And that's throughout the range studied. So this really has made, it's made a real difference, not qualitatively, but quantitatively made a huge difference to the importance, what we know about the importance uh, of blood pressure to vascular disease. And work done by Robert Clark on the Framingham Heart Study that's published in the American Journal of Epidemiology showed that actually it's not, it, it, this gets worse as time goes on. So in prospective studies, we're not looking at three years, we're looking at 10 years, 20 years of follow-up. And when we do that, actually, it looks like we're underestimating risk by, okay, about a third in the first decade of follow-up that I've just shown you but by maybe a half in the second decade and by up to two thirds by the third decade. So when you look at this, it's actually more remarkable that we ever saw an association between blood pressure and disease, um, given this fluctuation and the variability in, in blood pressure. It really is a remarkably strong um, risk factor. But re-measurement of a sample of the cohort, just um, maybe every five to 10 years, can correct for this bias. And you'll know that this is now incorporated into the design of cohorts. So it's, it's incorporated into the UK Biobank. It's incorporated into the China Kadori Biobank, into the Mexico City um, cohort study. And that's due to the, the work started by Richard and Rory and continued by, by Robert. And so finally, um, 
We also realised that there was something wrong with that figure, that initial figure in 1995, showing that the risks seemed to be very much greater at younger ages than at older ages. And that might be true relatively, because the absolute risk is much greater um, at older ages. And that actually we needed to do our analyses not by age at baseline, but by age at risk. And I've been working on this for um, four years. Uh, by this time, and we had these figures, but we kind of knew they weren't quite right. And again, Richard kept saying, well, they'll, they'll do. And at the time, I thought they'll do may, meant they'll do, but actually they'll do meant I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> so we did analysis by age at risk and not at baseline. And we had a bit of a light bulb moment. Again, I don't know if you remember this, Richard, but it was in a bar in Beijing. <laughs> Sorry, Simon. And then we, uh, and we were sat there and we were, we were working through and you suddenly had inspiration and so scribbled away, scribbled away. And when I got back to Oxford, I, unfortunately I couldn't find the original, but I had a 13 page fax waiting for me, 13 pages front and back. And there were bits underlined just in case I didn't quite understand their importance. And then this is the bit I like. The complexity is a bit irritating. But if it's accepted, we should get sensible answers, dash, as long as you're very careful with the detail of the programming, exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I think we decided that it was better left to other people. So Alison Palmer uh, and then Paul Sherlicker took over the detail of the programming. And thanks to their um, um, amazing programming. Not only did we use it for the Prospective Studies collaboration, but the, that, that code was the genesis for code that's now used for the uh, China Kaduri Biobank and for the Mexico City Prospective Study and for the other prospective studies um, that, we, um, that we do. So it did take a long time, but actually it was right. And the difference was, is really striking, I think. I hope you'll agree. So this is now the whole Prospective Studies collaboration, 34,000 deaths. These are analyses. This is age at risk. This is the age in, in, in which the people are dying. And you see that for premature mortality, uh, 20 millimetres of mercury, at systolic blood pressure, approximately halves risk throughout the range with no evidence um, above or, or importantly below which lower blood pressure was not associated with lower risk. And yes, it took seven years from when I arrived um, to get this published. But I think had we published in 1999, we might have got tens of citations, may, maybe hundreds if we were really lucky. But this paper, I can't believe this, has now been cited more than 6,000 um, times, which is really, and, and is still being cited um, today, despite it now being uh, 17 years old. We, we then went on to look at um, cholesterol. So again, Times have moved on, really. When we started this, people were still looking at total cholesterol. T um, but times have moved on, and really, we, we would have preferred to be looking at LDL cholesterol. But we didn't have the data on that. Only about 200,000 of the participants in these studies had data. But despite that, we still um, showed that 2 millimetres of uh, millimoles per litre of usual total cholesterol approximately halves the risk of um, cardiac mortality throughout um, the range. And then the final um, paper um, in this series was by um, my lovely uh, friend and colleague Gary Whitlock who came to Oxford in 2001 for two years. You'll notice there's a theme here, two years. And, um, and he came for two years as a Girdler's Fellow and I remember sitting with him as he showed me the list of papers he was, he was going to write in those two years. Anyway, <laughs> Eight years later, <coughs> he, um, he did amazing work on BMI and all-cause mortality. And um, I think maybe from about um, three years in, so maybe from 2004 to 2008, um, Richard, and, um, Richard and Gary used to sit down together to go through the detail of um, the analyses and again it was kind of it was thinking of through those details that I think makes all the difference in in this um, analysis that was done by Gary um, where he showed that um, if overweight so this BMI of about 25 ideal weight maybe from just below that there's an approximate doubling 
for every 10 um, units uh, higher BMI in both men and women. And again, it's kind of it's 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 down it's down to the detail that you get these these beautiful figures and straight line uh, relationships. And importantly, they then went on to look separately in people who'd smoked and people who hadn't smoked because there's still unlike for blood pressure this apparent j-shaped relationship so this increasing risk when when um, at lower bmi is that confounded by smoking people who smoke in high income countries not necessarily in low income countries but in high income countries tend to have um, lower uh, bmi and indeed they did suggest that the, among the never smokers the increased risk was much higher, so that that higher risk was smoking-related um, causes. So in the never smokers, little or no excess risk at low BMI. I have to confess I stopped going to the meetings after I sat for two hours while Richard and Gary discussed the uh, phrasing for the footnote of Web Table 8. <laughs> <laughs> kind of... Anyway, but it did make a difference, and... and the BBC picked up on it. Interestingly, their headline wasn't quite right. Obesity danger rivals smoking. Because the reality is, it's only severe obesity that's as hazardous as a lifetime of smoking. So moderate obesity, by which I mean a BMI of 30 to 35, uh, reduces life expectancy by about three years. But it's only severe obesity, so sort of doubling your body weight, if I was about 15 or 16 stone, would I have the same <coughs> risk as a lifetime of smoking and shortening uh, my life by about a decade. So that was the early part of my career. And then about um, six or seven years ago, I started working with uh, Richard again on cohort studies from low and middle income countries. And these were uh, five cohort studies that were all started around the turn of the century involving uh, 1.4 million people. They've now been tracked for about 15 years on average. And because um, of the work done uh, in this unit, that knowing that we need to do resurveys, and all followed up uh, for mortality, mortality follow-up. And one of the advantages of, of looking in these different cohort studies in different parts of the world is that you get substantial heterogeneity in exposures and in disease outcomes. So you're able to look at exposures that you just can't find in... Um, in, in one country. So, for example, in Mexico, which is um, by Hello, Jesus Alegre and Pablo Curi and John Emerson here in Oxford, um, extreme obesity, diabetes is common. About 20% of 60 year olds have diabetes and it's poorly controlled. So, you just can't look at those extremes um, in, um, if, if you just look in one country. In, in Russia, incredibly high alcohol consumption. If you want to study alcohol, Go, go to Russia. And then in Chennai, where they're very lean, mean BMI of about 22, 23. Again, if you really want to look at what's happening at that low end of the BMI distribution, you need to go somewhere where you have healthy pe people who are healthy walking around with a low BMI. So what did we see for blood pressure in these um, cohorts? And Here's uh, data from four of them, and actually it's remarkably similar between these cohorts, whether you're in Mexico, Cuba, India, um, or, or Russia, the approximate doubling in risk for every 20 millimetres of mercury. Somewhat stronger, somewhat weaker in some of the countries, but on average, an approximate doubling in risk. And also, maybe more surprisingly, and this is work done by some of our um, MSc students, that the prevalence of hypertension um, um, was also about the same, about 50% in each country, so a bit higher in some and a bit lower in others. But what was really strikingly different in these countries was the very different rates of treatment and control, ranging from just 4% um, in, in, in the China Kaduri Biobank to 20% in the Cuba um, study, where they, they might be poor in Cuba, but they do have a good primary um, healthcare system. And so they were treating people, they're not controlling them very well, but really a lot of the um, people with measured hypertension are being treated. So actually pretty similar for blood pressure, so do we need to look in all these cohorts and can we just um, use UK Biobank? Well actually let's look at adiposity and diabetes. So this was work done by, uh, or that we did with John Dinesh in Cambridge and Frank Hu in 
um, in Boston, and it came out of, despite the findings from the Prospective Studies Collaboration, in 2012, there was another um, systematic review published suggesting that actually there was no increased risk among people who are overweight, and actually you do have to be obese before there's an increase in risk. And so John Dinesh and Frank Hu and colleagues decided that they get together the world uh, literature, the world data, or not literature, the world data on uh, BMI, and they got data on 11 million adults, uh, or parallel analyses on data on 11 million adults from 239 studies. And again, attention to the statistical detail. They avoided reverse, they got a big, a big number, they avoided reverse causality, they excluded the first five years of follow-up, and they excluded never, they excluded smokers, so restricted to never smokers, no prior disease, and leaving, still leaving 55,000 CHD deaths in 4 million adults. And again, what they saw was that if overweight, 10 kilograms per meter squared approximately halves, halves risk, down to a BMI of about uh, 22 and a half. So what do we see in our cohorts? And this is the Mexico City Prospective um, Study, which is coordinated, as I said, jointly um, from Mexico City um, by John Emerson here in Oxford. So questionnaire, the usual um, prospective study questionnaire, physical measurements. Linkage, you can't link directly. There's no uh, national ID. So the, the linkage is done uh, with field work um, and a matching algorithm by a probabilistic algorithm. Uh, algorithm and importantly diabetes only accepted uh, for acute diabetic crises so what did they see for BMI versus vascular and metabolic mortality we have to combine those in Mexico vascular and metabolic mortality in Mexico with a mean mean BMI of 29 units that's pretty high for a mean BMI and this is work this is Louisa Natiuk's um, PhD, so this is work that she's been doing uh, with John and Robert and others. And when you just do a naive analysis, so no exclusions, you see this striking U-shaped association where the lowest risk actually appears to be among the people who are sort of borderline obese, a BMI um, of about 30. And if anything, higher risk for people with a BMI of um, 22 and a half than for people with a BMI of 37 and a half. But I said there's real problems with diabetes in, in Mexico. 20% of those aged 60 um, have diabetes. But not only do they have diabetes, but it's really poorly controlled on the whole. It's not diagnosed. There's a lot of underdiagnosis. Even among the diagnosed, it's, it's, not, it's not well controlled. And the consequence of that is that by the time the people with diabetes are dying, then they're actually losing weight. And so what you see is that the people with low BMI actually contain a disproportionate number of people with diabetes. And so when you exclude diabetes and early follow-up, the picture looks really strikingly different. And now it looks really very similar to the PSC and to the global BMI. The NADI is still quite high compared to, um, compared to that global BMI. It's, it's sort of, uh, it is borderline overweight. But again, you see, if overweight, again, this 10 units, um, of BMI associated with approximate halving in risk, as in high-income countries. So what happens if now we go to a study where we've got a really low mean BMI? Maybe what you might expect is that that J-shape shifts to the left. So this is the Chennai Prospective Study. This is a um, study done by um, Dr. Gajalakshmi um, and she uh, follows 500, she recruited 500,000 people again at the turn of the century. This really is sort of barefoot epidemiology. There's no way of linking people electronically. And so she gets the death registry, she picks up some people, tries to match them, but people don't spell their name the same. They don't give the exact, they don't know their exact date of birth. It's really very difficult to, to get a computer algorithm to match. The days were. So the only really reliable way is to go walking the streets and go knocking on the doors. So she goes knocking on the doors, or her team go knocking on the doors of every participant. Takes about two years to go around the whole, the whole cohort. So they visit the cohorts and, and do their best to link to the death registry. But even if you manage to link to the death registry, there's no cause of death um, in, on, on the death certificate. And in fact, about half of deaths in India uh, of unknown cause according to the death certificate. And so what 
Gadger did was she developed this tool called the ver verbal autopsy to try and assign a probable um, cause of death. What does this entail? Well, it entails non-medical graduates go around, they go to the house and they interview a spouse or a relative or someone uh, who, who knows the, the dead person quite well. And then they just ask a series of sort of, semi, they do a semi-structured interview, write a narrative report, just detailing the events and the symptoms and treatment leading up to the death in the weeks and months, in chronological order leading up to the death. And then two physicians review the report to determine what they consider to be the probable underlying cause of death. And what Gadger showed was that actually you can attribute reasonably reliably a cause of death to about 90% of deaths um, in, in early and middle age before 70. And so this reduces the deaths from unspecified causes from about half to about a fifth, which is really important um, when you're doing epidemiology. And this verbal autopsy tool has now been implemented by the Registrar General um, across India. So what did we see for BMI in the Chennai study? Remember this J-shaped relationship that was shifted a bit to the, to the right in the Mexico um, study, in the heavy Mexico study. So these, this is the BMI. This is just the data from North America and Europe. There was really, even with um, 239 studies, 11 million people, there were actually not many people from, the web, from um, South Asia, about 4,000 deaths in total in the global BMI collaboration from South Asia. So if you remember, overweight, 10 units, approximately doubles the risk. When we looked in um, Chennai, 8,000 non-smoker cardiac deaths, premature cardiac deaths, and we see absolutely no association whatsoever between BMI and cardiac mortality. And this was surprising. And it was particularly surprising because BMI was associated with blood pressure. And as you saw, blood pressure was associated with risk. So there must be something else here that's inversely associated with BMI that's causing this, this pretty flat relationship between um, BMI and cardiac mortality. Is it that BMI isn't me measuring adiposity? Well, well, it's measuring something because it's predicting um, blood pressure. And so we're now going to go on. We're, um, ben Lacey and I are going down to Chennai in March to work with Gadja to... Um, investigate the feasibility of getting blood samples from um, a sample of these people and maybe even getting DEXA scans so that we can kind of really understand where is the fat lying in these people and is that um, an explanation for why the BMI uh, isn't associated with, with cardiac um, death. It's only death as well, maybe that's um, the explanation but um, at the moment, we, we need to explore this more. We're also, when Gadja was going around knocking on the doors, um, she was also asking people um, if they were there, whether they'd had a heart attack or a stroke or diabetes or cancer since the last visit. And so those data are now being coded up. And so hopefully we'll be able to look not only at cardiac mortality, but at cardiac incidence and see whether that offers um, any insight into this association. So moving on to smoking and, and drinking, and I uh, say if you want to study drinking, you need to go to Russia. Um, that's the place to go. So this is work with David Zaridzi from Moscow, 200,000 adults, again recruited around the turn of the century, in three cities in western Siberia, Tomsk, Bysk and Barnal. Incredibly high alcohol consumption and smoking rates in Russia. And really this work came out of seeing the not only high, but the high and fluctuating death rates in Russia. So this is the UK, 1980 to 2015. By contrast, these wildly fluctuating and high rates in Russia and the, the increases coincide with sort of political or economic um, disasters in Russia. And the hypothesis was that these, this is largely, these fluctuations are largely uh, due to, to alcohol. So what did we find when we compared, when we looked at alcohol, and uh, this is all-cause mortality in male smokers um, in the um, Russian prospective study. So first of all, we divided people up into three groups according 
to um, their vodka intake. Um, more than three bottles a week, one to three bottles a week. And in uh, Western Siberia, you're a light drinker if you drink less than a bottle of vodka a week. This is looking at 20-year 20, 20 risk now, so for people <coughs> ages 35 to 54. Because the heavy drinkers were also 90% of them were smokers, you can't tease out the difference between smoking and alcohol. So we're now looking in just the male smokers by vodka use at entry. And for those who are entry were drinking five bottles a week, 20, uh, the, uh, age 35, 20 years later, a third of them would be dead. So by age 55, a third of, of those men um, would, would be dead. And that this was largely due to alcohol. The diseases that we pre-specified as being alcohol-related with really very little association between alcohol and what, uh, the other causes that we didn't think were going to be related to alcohol. And then the other thing to note here is that actually we, it, it isn't really associated. It's not a third higher, you know, it's not a third um, of, of men dead, not 35% risk for drinking five bottles a week. Because when we, there was a sort of serendipitous resurvey in this, in this cohort. And when you looked, only half of the people who'd been drinking heavily at the baseline were still drinking heavily three or four years later. And so actually, this may, may be, this is associated with just drinking three bottles of of vodka a week. So these people who really are drinking heavily are really at um, massively increased risk of death. By contrast, the tobacco hazards didn't seem to be as big in, in Russia as they are um, currently in the UK that we've seen from the British doctors and the Million Women study where the people who've smoked 20 cigarettes a day throughout their adult life are about a three times higher risk of dying before they're 70 compared to the never smokers here, it was maybe about twofold relative risk. These are in, among the men who drank less than a bottle of vodka a week. So although the relative risk was lower, the absolute risk is huge because of the, um, because of the underlying causes of death. And we estimated that about two thirds of all um, male deaths in middle age in, in Russia are caused by tobacco and alcohol. But if you really want to study smoking, you want to go to Cuba. So here we've got 145,000 adults recruited, again, sort of just at the end of the 20th century, turn of the century, and substantial numbers um, started to smoke in early childhood. Basically, these kids, they go out working in the tobacco fields and they get paid with, with cigarettes, and so they start to smoke young. Mm -hmm. Whereas we might say if we had data from people who were starting to smoke at the age of five, in the UK, we might think that was a data error. There are just too many of them, really starting very, very young. And I just want to say a bit about this study because it's really remarkable. So this is Alfredo, who is the, the PI, the original PI of the study. He's now in his 70s. He started this study in the middle of the special period. This was really poor time in, in Cuba. And they had to fit the whole questionnaire on one side of A4 because paper was so scarce in 1996 to 2001. He also told us while we were there, so this was when we were visiting um, last year, but he also told us while we were there that actually while he was doing the study, there was no petrol. He had no petrol for his car, so he walked the five miles to work and back every day um, in, in this period and that he went down to about seven stones so it was really quite a remarkable time to not only be just surviving but also setting up a massive cohort study of 150,000 um, people and he managed to cram quite a lot actually in his one page and the really important question he asked from our point of view now was about at about what age did you start smoking tobacco regularly and I've already said that there were substantial numbers not only starting as, as young teenagers, but even at ages five to nine. And when we divided up um, the people according to the age at which they started smoking, a much greater risk of adult, uh, adult life, don't forget these are deaths sort of between 35 and 69, much higher risk for those people who started smoking uh, when they were very young compared to the people who started smoking um, in, in adulthood. And this is work uh, done by Blake Thompson, who's studying smoking in both the Cuba um, and the Mexico study, and these are unpublished, hopefully soon to be published, Blake findings from um, 
from Cuba. So just want to go back to the Chennai Prospective Study because we're now starting, so these are sort of hot off the press uh, results. We're starting to look at smoking in the Chennai study. The women don't smoke there, fewer than, uh, well, a few percent smoke, really no smoking. But among the men, about 40% of them were smoking at the baseline and 30% of them were drinking regularly. I've already alluded to the low BMI and therefore low rates or, uh, of diabetes and really quite low, low blood pressure. But what was quite striking is that only half of these men were actually educated past um, primary level. And, and actually, you can't look at smoking without taking into account education. It's so highly confounded that just adjusting for education isn't enough. <coughs> and just to see the effect of education, this is mortality by education at ages 35 to 69. And this is in the men and women who do not smoke or drink. And I've just put here, the, the, just to remind you, the 2010 UK rates. So these are 2010 rates. Again, 35-year risk of death. So the chances of a 35-year-old dying by the time they're 70. So it was 4%, men and women joint, 4% dead by the age of 70. If we look in, in Chennai, among the men who don't even smoke or drink, even those with, a higher, with higher education, um, beyond school, education beyond school, um, over a fifth of them will be dead by the time they're 70. And twice, twice the risk for people who had uh, no education or didn't even complete primary education, twice, I mean, both men and women, twice as likely to be dead by the time they're 70 um, compared with the people with higher education. So you really have to take this into account when you're looking at um, smoking and drinking in, in India. So what's the added effect of smoking or drinking? I say we can't study this in the women, but we can study it in the men. And, a, and you see that at every level of education, about a doubling in risk, about twi it doubles the risk of death by 70 uh, for smoking and drinking, um, regardless really of the level of education. So now you've got these men who both smoke and drink, 60% of them, of the 35 year olds will be dead by the time they're 70 among the men with no education who both smoke and drink. So a really important problem in, for India. So I hope I've managed to convince you that um, we need more of these big and simple study and long term prospective studies in as many populations as possible because we need the reliable evidence, we need country-specific evidence on these big modifiable causes of premature mortality and we need to monitor their different and often changing effects in um, the many populations because if we don't measure it then we can't act on it. I hope I've also convinced you that although big studies in low middle income countries aren't easy, they, they, are, they are possible. I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge our masters because that, that's sort of the end of, of my research but in recent years I've also got involved in teaching and it's been a real pleasure to be involved in the masters so we redesigned the masters in 2014 for 2014 and since then we've had over 100 students go through 29 have gone on to do PhDs 21 of those within NDPH so it's sort of a real success from us and it was it was actually a real delight over the weekend to get this email from uh, one of our alumni who was here in, I think, 2015, 16, who said in an email to Robert and I that she's constantly reflecting on the MSc and the numerous ways that the programme allowed her to grow as a student. Thank you so much for the multiple ways you've supported and fostered my growth. And I, I think it's emails like that and comments that, like that that, re that make it all worthwhile. You students, you really give a buzz um, to the department and I didn't realise we missed you before we had you so it's really great <laughs> having master's students um, I started off going around taking photos of, of people who I wanted to thank and I thought oh, actually I'm on a hiding to nothing here this is going to be a disaster I'm bound to miss someone out so I thought maybe this was a better solution <laughs> And it's always sunny in NDPH and it's always happy. So thank you um, very much to everybody who's, who's, who I've had the pleasure of working with over um, 
the last 24 years. I have listed the people in my team because without you it really wouldn't have happened and they're very carefully in alphabetical order. Uh, I, I think I have to say a special thank you to Paul because without his endless cups of tea, I don't think we'd be here. Thank you very much to the MSc teaching team, to the Graduate Studies Office, because without them, uh, the MSc would not function. They really do a fantastic job. And thanks to my DPhil students, again, for that buzz, and it's just a real pleasure to, uh, to work with you. But um, I'd like to take this opportunity to say a huge thanks to both Richard and Rory for taking me in in 1997 when the MRC decided they didn't want to continue funding um, the prospective studies uh, collaboration and for continuing to support me uh, throughout for the last 24 years and also of course a big thanks to everyone else who, who's also supported me. Um, a special thanks to Robert who I can't see at the moment, he's just been the best mentor um, you could ask for um, but it's all really is hugely appreciated. And I apologise to the front row for this, but I started with family. <laughs> I'm going to end <laughs> with family. And, um, you know, it wouldn't happen without these guys. Thank you, Simon, for all the love and support I've had over the years. really has made a huge difference. You've picked up the balls I've dropped. You've always um, been there. There have been times when it's been a bit more like this. <laughs> But I hope it's been more, more like that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I think uh, uh, Sarah demonstrated that not only it's a, been fantastic achievements over the past X years, X years. <laughs> uh, but also a, a lot to come with these uh, the studies in the developing countries. And uh, looking forward to those findings coming out. Something just to remember today um, from the department, and this is uh, something from the Green Templeton College oh. uh, to again. Um, uh, remember for a shorter period of time yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, today and uh, to, to sort of say what a fantastic uh, achievement. So Thank you very much. There are drinks Thank and uh, canapes outside. Thank you.